Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Jim Fallows, who is the national correspondent for the Atlantic Monthly. Jim, welcome back to Berkeley. Um, Harry, it's a pleasure to be here and to be on your program again. Thank you. Uh, it's great to have you. And you're here on campus giving the Sanford Elberg Lecture. So you've been living now in China for about a year? For about two, but who's counting? Yeah, and, <laughs> and written a number of uh, really interesting article on, on the people, life there, and uh, the economics uh, of the situation. Let, let's talk, let's focus on some of the economic issues. Uh, you, you said in a previous interview that you like to go places and, and really get a feel for the place and then be able to come back and write stuff and say, this is what I learned. And you've learned a lot about uh, Chinese manufacturing and, and this behemoth that has been created over the last couple of decades. Tell us a little about it and what, what really stands out and what, what surprised you. And before talking about manufacturing itself, which I, I think is, is a really important element of China these days, I just want to talk about the experience as a whole. You know, mm -hmm. my wife and I, as you and I have discussed before, in the 1980s, we lived for four years in Japan and Malaysia with our kids who were then young. And we first went to China in 1986, which really was when people all still had the gray and blue suits and there were hardly any cars. And while I'd been to China a number of times since then, I hadn't spent a lot of time there. And so two plus years ago in June of 2006, uh, my wife and I went off for a more or less open-ended stay there working for the Atlantic and we'll probably be there for three years total until the summer of mm -hmm. 2009. And we can get later into the whole catalog of things which are different from what one expects mm -hmm. or from what I expected. But uh, let's, let's talk for a moment about manufacturing because it is in a sense what makes China important to everybody else now. It's surprising how you can classify almost all of China's achievements in the 25 plus years of modernization to either manufacturing, making the things we buy, or construction, building all the things people saw in the Olympics and the roads and the ports and the skyscrapers and everything else. In the manufacturing, I think it's, it's cliched but interesting to talk about its scale. Mm -hmm. Where you go to, say, Guangdong province, north of Hong Kong, and it has a bigger manufacturing workforce than the United States does in this one mm -hmm. province. And to see the, the interaction of sociology and history and technology and international diplomacy in one institution of the, of the factory, sociology, and you see all these young people, largely women, young women in the electronics factories, who've come from the hinterland, and this is the mm -hmm. way they're changing their lives, like in Europe 150 years ago. And the interaction with the US, I'll just, you know, I'll give a break so that you can steer me after this. When I lived in Japan, the most interesting thing about manufacturing there, apart from its sophistication and its high-techness, is how purely Japanese it was. A very little role for mm -hmm. foreign companies. In China, it's the opposite. It's how international it is. Almost everything of value you see made there is, on contract for Apple or HP or Dell or Sanyo or Siemens or Nokia or whoever else. So it's the workshop of the world for companies from the whole world. And the way that nets out what China's part of the equation is and how it hurts and helps other countries is really interesting to look into. And, and what you're describing in the article, and, and we'll, we'll actually talk about the people and, and the general situation in a minute, but is that in this province, basically, China is able to bring together the resources to produce these products. And one of the main resources, you point out, is labor, yeah. basically. And, and so uh, huge numbers of people organized to meet the specs uh, of uh, foreign countries. Yes, and there's a whole field of engineering and design called design for China production. That is, if you're gonna see a laptop computer or something that's made in China now, it's made differently from the way it would be made in Tokyo or made in Sunnyvale or wherever because there's this recognition that the cost of labor is about one-tenth as much mm -hmm. in China as it is in, uh, in the expensive parts of the developed world. That may change, Chinese labor is getting more expensive, but for now, you find, on the one hand, things done in a very high-tech way. You know, the printed circuit boards that are the guts of the computer are, are put together with the same robots that would be done uh, anyplace else. And when I asked people why, they said, here's the guideline for when you use a robot in China. Mm -hmm. It's when 
people can't do it precisely enough themselves. You know, mm -hmm. Only a machine can do it. So you have that. On the other hand, you have, let's see, if I have a, do you have a, a pen? If you give me your yeah, pen, pen yeah. you will find, this was probably made in China, and there probably is a young woman who's snapping these two parts together. If this were done in Germany or France, they'd have a machine doing that. But when you have labor that is mm -hmm. so cheap, you can have some young woman paid every second for 10 hours a day to snap these things together. And a virtue of that from the, uh, from the manufacturing China perspective is if you have people doing a lot of jobs that machines or machine tools would do elsewhere, you can change like that. You know, mm -hmm. a factory is making pens today can make toothbrushes tomorrow and, and, and whatever. So there's a kind of flexibility and very high speed response to, you see to this low wage um, workforce in southern China. Now, uh, in, in the article on manufacturing, which appeared in the Atlantic, you, you uh, uh, described the work of a man, I can't remember what you call him, but he, he was an Irishman, I think. Yes, and, Liam Casey. Yes, Mr. China. <laughs> Mr. China. China. And so tell, tell our audience a little about that, because he's a Westerner who went uh, east uh, many years ago and then settled in China and has become a kind of an entrepreneur bringing all these factors of production together. Yes, and I should make clear for any China-savvy viewers in the audience that Mr. China is a long-standing joke title. Oh, it's like Mr. Excitement or <laughs> Mr. <laughs> October in baseball yeah, or something. Right. And it's I was saying that as of this moment, Liam Casey is Mr. China yeah. by my standards. Yeah. And here's his story in brief. Liam Casey is now, let's say, as you, as, as you and I talk, he's in his early 40s. Let's say he's 42, 43. He finished high school in a farm in Ireland and didn't go to college. And he worked in a little garment shop, garment factory mm -hmm. in Ireland. He came to the US and started setting up factories here, but couldn't get a green card. So his entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial mm -hmm. energy, America's immigration policies shoved out the door. Mm -hmm. So he went to Taipei for a while and he went to Hong Kong and then he moved into China. And the niche he found was connecting people in the Western world, in, in Europe or the US or sometimes Japan, who had an idea for a new product with somebody in China who could make that more quickly and more reliably and cheaper than it could be mm -hmm. done anyplace else. And he's been uh, the just the matchmaker for a lot of the outsourcing economy of the world. And through him, I found a way to kind of price out outsourcing, who gets the money when something with an American label is made in China, and it's a surprising figure, which we'll come to later on, but he's, well, Liam Casey is a fascinating guy because in the terrain around his office in Shenzhen, uh, which is just outside Hong Kong, there are tens of thousands of little tiny mom and pop factories. You know, mm -hmm. the old days in the US, we had mom and pop stores, they have mom and pop factories making little tiny gears or little tiny, uh, uh, chips or whatever else, and the expertise Liam's Liam's company called uh, Pacific China. It's, it's oh, it's PCH, named for Pacific Coast Highway in the U.S. When he was living in uh, <laughs> Laguna, uh, PCH uh, China Holdings. It, you know, you want something made, you want some, you know, the glasses you're wearing right now, you might want copies of those made in China. He'll find the people who can do that. And he's mapped out the factories with GPS coordinates, with maps that are more up to date than mm -hmm. what the government has, with a computer program to show you who exactly can do what and combine with what other company. So that's that's his expertise and it's become a huge business. Mm -hmm. and, and the scale here is unbelievable. You say, uh, at one point, 90 percent of laptops and notebooks sold under the famous brand names are actually made by one of these five companies in their factories in mainland China, namely Quanta, Compal, Inventec, Wistorn, Asus Tech. <laughs> Indeed, nobody in the U.S. has heard of any of these companies. Yeah. And, and it's a fascinating example of sort of triangulation in modern trade. These companies are all based in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. They do almost all their work in mainland China and southern China. And if you buy, I've seen assembly lines run by one of these companies, which I won't name, where three of the most famous <laughs> rival uh, mm -hmm. brand name laptops were coming off the same line. You know, the same Taiwanese company working in China was making companies, making computers for these Japanese and American firms, which battled it out in the marketplace about how theirs is so much more reliable. They're all coming from the same place. The mm -hmm. same young Chinese women are, are, are putting them together. So it's, uh, when people say that China is the workshop of the world, they mean that there's been this really sweeping integration of a whole lot, not all, but a, whole, a particular kind of manufacturing work where the product is relatively light, where you can design it so that there's a fair amount of la labor component, which you can uh, do cheaply, that that's where it's done now. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, talk a little about the the, the factory workers themselves. Uh, by our standards, uh, uh, the the individual worker is not making. Uh, uh, very much, but it's a complex story, right. as you point out. So tell us, give us a feel right. for these uh, young women or young men working in these right. factories. So let's first rule out one topic from consideration, which is the real slavery type operations mm -hmm. in the sweatshops. There are a lot of really hard, I mean, on an absolute scale, everything in China, there's a lot of, because there's so many people. So there are a significant number of places that are really abusive, where people sometimes are, are enslaved. There have been exposés in China, uh, very dangerous coal mines and heavy machinery works. Machinery works. So that, that is true, and it's bad. Uh, however, the places that are most likely to connect with the outside world are the factories that are not like that, because they're run as spec contractors for Western companies, and there, in electronics works, in consumer good factories, which is most of what we see, the typical woman, the typical worker is a young woman because it's relatively light work. It's not you know having construction beams and all this. She will probably be in her late teens to late 20s. She'll have come from Anhui province or Sichuan province or Hubei province, someplace where, where there's a lot of people and it's poor. And she will come, usually relationships are set up between one village and one factory, or one village and one area where there's a number of factories, and there's a predictable flow that goes back and forth. On, in the homeland, the family's cash income from farming might have been the equivalent of, let's say, 150 to 200 U.S. per year. In the factory, this young woman can make about that much per month which is nothing by U.S. standards, nothing by German factors, but obviously is a revolution for somebody whose whole family was making that much per year, and she's making it per month. They typically live in dormitories with a number of people per room. They typically do it for a couple of years. Then some of them stay in the big city, you know, a significant number. Some of them go back home and get married, you know, have money to build a, a new house. Uh, there are parts of this situation which, of course, are abusive, you know, when people feel as if they have no life and they are working, you know, 12-hour shifts, 14-hour shifts. There are overtime laws in China, and in theory, and actually in practice, the pay package includes overtime pay, but still it's, it's fairly low as, as a total package. So that's the, the deal which, if compared to contemporary United States, is a bad deal. If compared to contemporary China, is not that bad. And compared to the U.S. or Europe in their industrialization stage, is a lot like what those countries uh, went through. There's an interesting sense of this movement maybe having reached its high water mark for, for two reasons. One is there are pressures in the areas where they have all these factories to have better labor standards, the land's getting more expensive, labor's getting more expensive, so maybe it's moving up the price scale. And second, in the villages, there are, thanks to the one-child policy, thanks to the reasons, there's not as limitless a supply of these people anymore. Mm -hmm. And many of them are saying, well, gee, if I can stay on the land, that would be a little bit better. So it's not the same flood of people mm -hmm. that you had at certain times, but there's still a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, 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 China is engaging in a conversation about how it might change its strategies. I, I, I guess there's a, uh, I, I believe this is called the Pearl River strategy, mm -hmm. where they're, they're using globalization in, in places like the province you're describing to, to, to build the economic uh, resources uh, that they have, but, but at a price mm -hmm. to, to what, and we'll talk about that right. in a minute. You said at, at uh, one point, and I thought this was very important, you said, uh, uh, so the standard of living for these workers is not bad when we remember that food and housing is subsidized. Chinese workers can save most of what she makes. The Chinese worker can ma save most of what she makes. And she feels that she's on the way up. Mm. And, and, and that is very important. So string that out a little because it, it's, it, it's about a rising power and, right. and, and how it uh, impacts on its own people mm. and, and where they see themselves going. This is one of many things that, that just are interesting in being in, in China day by day. You know, objectively, China is immeasurably less rich than the United States is. You know, there's no institution like, like Berkeley in China. The universities, in fact, there are pretty bad. And just as you walk around, I've been back in the U.S. in Northern California for 
a week now, as you and I talk. I'm going to go to China and in, in back to China in two days. It's just it's so rich here, and there's nothing comparable to that in China, even on the upper fringe when you've got your, your, your billionaire. So it's a poor country. Many people lack things which that would be considered necessities here, and yet there is a sense that the general motion is up for the country, for most individuals, and most family narratives. Now, of course, there are exceptions, and there's lots and lots of protests when people lose their land, if their lake gets polluted, if their children are born deformed because of uh, contaminants and all the rest. So there's a lot of protest and a lot of pressure, but the way Americans must have felt, I guess, in the early 1950s or whenever, of movement ahead and thinking, mm -hmm. If the, if the choice is the country on the right track or the wrong track, most Chinese people, in my observation, think the country's on the right track. And certainly there was a study by Pew, I think, um, in the summertime of 2008, saying that, that the Chinese, China had the highest reading of any country on earth and people being confident about the country's future, feeling as if it was going along. And so if you're going from $1,000 a year income to $1,200 a year income, that's a low level, but it's a big increase. And so you can do a little bit more each, each year. And so I think that, that is an important component of the psychology of China now. Uh, you, you, in your previous work, as you mentioned that you had gone to China and in, in, our, in our first interview, you mentioned that you were interested in how institutions uh, uh, transform themselves, basically, the culture that makes it possible, the institutions. And so this, this uh, description of manufacturing is, is really about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way things come together, you know, drawing on uh, the best that the Chinese people have to or offer and, and organizing yeah. it to, to achieve this accomplishment, basically. That's true, and, and there are two interesting implications of that, to me at least. One of them manufacturing-centric and the other about the whole social order. Manufacturing-centric, uh, you were mentioning earlier this Pearl River Project and other efforts where the Chinese officials are saying, we've had this great success with low-end manufacturing where can we go from here? Mm -hmm. Can we move up into the high end? And it's, it's really an open question of how well China will be able to do in that. Because if you look around the world, there are certain traits that high value work is associated with. Very strong university systems is one of them. Uh, and so there's a question, can you have really strong university systems with a closed political system, a closed uh, media system, which China still does have? That's an interesting uh, situation. Uh, their intellectual property situation is uh, troublesome, mm -hmm. as, as everyone knows. And Everything so, can be copied and sold uh, on the yes. street for much less. The main uh, exception was we were in Beijing for the month before the Olympic Games and, and then during the Olympics. And starting about one month before the Olympics, all the vendors of fake Olympic goods were driven <laughs> away. The other <laughs> fake see. stuff, sure, no problem. But the <laughs> fake Olympic goods you couldn't find for the month before the Games. They're back now, yeah. I'm relieved to say. So so for there is a question, can they can change the institutions um, of manufacturing? And for the whole society, what I think is really interesting about China is the ongoing experiment with how the whole place evolves. You know, the manufacturing we've been talking about is a result of Deng Xiaoping mm -hmm. uh, almost 30 years ago saying, we're going to do something different. Mm -hmm. And you have the feel in a positive way that the rules are being made up almost every day of mm -hmm. how much is going to be controlled, how much is not going to be controlled. And it's been a pretty successful experiment over 30 mm -hmm. years. And that continuing adjustment of where the government will be involved and, and where, where not with some obvious huge exceptions like Tiananmen Square. But that, that's, uh, that makes it interesting to, of how a institution as large as a billion country, uh, billion person mm -hmm. country can evolve. And, and really this then is about the Communist Party changing basically and, and opening up the system and, and in cases, in places, uh, for example, in environmental mm -hmm. issues where a lot of damage is being done, people are th being thrown off their land and so on, you know, there, there, there isn't a feedback mechanism other than demonstrations right. breaking out and so yeah. on. Well, you know, interestingly, you mentioned the, the Communist Party and, and the environment. What's fast, two points that are interesting to me, again, the Communist Party, if you ask people what does communism mean and, and, and all that, there are some, especially older people who openly pine for the days of, of communism, when the government would take care of people and be the protector in old age and all that. that that's a, clearly a minority view in China. So there's very little communist about the regime anymore, except its insistence on political control. You know, there really is, 
you don't joke about contests for political power, you don't joke about the media, you don't, mm. don't jo joke about certain crucial areas that are off limits. So that's, it's a largely open economy with a still largely closed political system, which, which, is, uh, which is a balance they'll either be able to maintain or not. On the environment, it is interesting how many feedback mechanisms they're beginning to develop and how in a way, although the government is not formally accountable through elections, it considers itself accountable in sort of pop popularity. If people are too unhappy about deformed babies or about mm -hmm. poisoned land or about no water, there has been some response from the officials say we, we gotta deal with that. And so you see a sort of pro-consumer, pro-environment shift in the main government policies in the last couple of years. Uh, let, let's not talk about the money because that's what everybody is focused on here. And, and to do that, we have to, I want you to explain to us how much of a, a $30 electronic device actually stays in China and then what happens yeah. to that amount of money. Well, this was part of the pricing out of items I was doing uh, in China with, with my, my Mr. China contact, the, uh, the outsourcer, Liam Casey. And he was showing me a number of Ethernet cables as a specimen example. And these were the standard Cat5 cables everybody uses to, to plug into an Ethernet port. And he showed me one that was shown by a, sold by under a famous brand name that I won't give right now, but mm -hmm. it's sort of a high-end electronics and audio retailer. And I think the retail price of this would be $29.95 or something like that, it would be a, a relatively large amount. And then there was the kind of twilight gray zone of brand, uh, brand relevance. It would be sold in an electronic store with a different kind of brand name for maybe half that much money, let's say $15. Then there's some commodity sale you might get on eBay for, for $10 or whatever. The actual cost of that cable coming out of the factory in China would be a dollar and a half, something like that. You know, labor and everything, a tiny, almost you know, invisible portion of the actual sales cost. So most of the money from electronics cables, from laptop computers is going number one to retailers in the Western world, number two to the brand name people who can say that if I have a certain brand name, this is a $30 item, not a $5 item, uh, to the after service people, to the industrial designers, to the copyright and patent holders. So uh, the China has retained a lot of money over the last 20 years from, from its export surpluses, but, but people close to manufacturing argue that even more money has been generated for Intel, for Microsoft, mm -hmm. for UPS, for FedEx, for Best Buy, for, for everybody else who's involved in the process. Mm -hmm. and, and so let, let's uh, walk through this uh, device. Uh, and and this, this $3 uh, is made by the merchant. Uh, three, we'll, we'll yeah. speak in, in dollars uh, for our audience. And, and so what happens then to that money? Because this is where uh, the global implications of right. what's going on are quite extraordinary. Right, and this is, this may be, <laughs> I laid all this out in an article a couple of months ago in The Atlantic, and it's so complex I may have forgotten some of the steps. Well, I'll remind <laughs> okay. you, yeah. But, but in essence, here's the deal, you have some, Let's say, let's use the example I did use in the article because it's something I saw for myself. If you use an electronic toothbrush in, in the US or Europe, sold by a famous brown name like Brown or, or uh, Gillette, which I believe is the parent company now or whatever, but some, some Panasonic, you know, any one of these famous brand name toothbrushes, and let's say, you know, you spend, let's say you spend some multiple of $10 on it, 20 or $30, and let's say, say at $3 is making its way back to the factory in China. Then they have to, uh, let's make this easier. Let's say they get ten dollars. Let's just let's let's go crazy and say they get ten. <laughs> they have to pay their workers. They have to give them food. They have to buy the dormitories. They have to pay rent for their factory. Let's say they use five dollars in China, but 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 they can't spend those dollars in China. Mm -hmm. They're spending people. They're paying people in the RMB, the Chinese currency, or RMB. So they have to take this ten dollars they've gotten from me or they've mm -hmm. gotten from CVS, or they've gotten from Walmart, or they've gotten from, and so they have this $10 that Walmart's giving them. They have to take it to the Chinese banks to be able to trade it in to RMB. And, that's, and that is their currency. The that's RMB. the currency, yeah, yes, yeah. currency. And so it has various names. Some, sometimes the informal name is Kwai, you know, I'll give you three Kwai, it's sort of a counter, or it's, or it's a UN or RMB. I'll, I'll call them RMB. Yeah, good. <laughs> so, uh, meaning people's money. Uh, so to use people's money, they have to change the foreign money in for that. And the 
crucial thing, if this were happening in Switzerland, if it were happening in Italy, happening in the US, you could just go to the currency exchange and swap it back in. You can't do that in China. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, and this is the crucial part of the Chinese accumulation of assets over the years, while decontrolling most of the economy, the Chinese government wants to keep tight control of it over the value of its currency and foreign exchange. It wants to be able to make sure its goods don't get priced too high. It wants to make sure the economy is not destabilized by rapid flows of money in and out. So this leading is the, to inflation, yes, which would hit inflation. the workers who, exactly, yeah. and what could lead to could an, uh, aggravate the kinds of inflationary concerns which are very, very acute in China now. As much as the U.S. is fearing deflation right now with mortgages and banks and the stock market, China is fearing inflation, mm -hmm. where food prices especially have been shooting up. And this is, of course, of primitive fear for people, I mean, of basic, uh, uh, basic fear for people who have starved you know, in, their, in, in, in past memory. So the Chinese bank that takes your dollars will give a certain number of um, of RMB on a fixed on a rate that the government fixes, the government mm -hmm. controls, and it slides a little bit. The RMB has been getting steadily stronger against the dollar, but it doesn't fluctuate freely by the market. This means there's a kind of imbalance. The RMB, the dollar is worth artificially much against the RMB, so people are always trying. They know the dollar is going to go down, so they keep trying to exchange dollars as fast as they can. This money piles up inside the Chinese banks, mm -hmm. and again, in other countries the market would take care of this. In China, they don't want to let the market take care of it, so they have all these dollars they have to do something with. What they've mainly done with them is give them back to us. Mm -hmm. but, buy, and in what way do they do that? By buying U.S. government bonds, bonds. by investing in Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, <laughs> uh, by putting money into just the U.S. stock market. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't all go into the U.S., but a lot of the, when you look at the whole financial bubble, of the mm -hmm. last decade in the U.S., a lot of the money supporting it has been Chinese and other foreign money coming to what looks like a safe investment haven. And it's worth remembering, to, to buy U.S. securities, they have to do it with dollars. So it mm -hmm. means they're not trading this into other currencies, they're keeping those dollars, which keeps the value of the dollar up. Keep, so everything that's been comfortable for the U.S. in the last decade, the Chinese have helped underwrite. Stock market has been higher, mm -hmm. the dollar has been higher, Interest mortgages rate have here, been, have been yeah. lower, yeah. tax rates have been lower because they've yeah. been floating our bonds. Yeah. So they have essentially, poor people have been underwriting a rich country. Mm -hmm. And now they're seeing a lot of these holdings melt away, which is even more aggravating to them than to us because number one, they're poorer, and number two, they can say it's these other people's fault. Mm -hmm. no. Now here from, from this article, this is the real meaning of the vast trade surplus, you write. 1.4 trillion and counting, going up about a billion per day that the Chinese government has mostly parked in U.S. Treasury notes. In effect, every person in the rich United States has over the past 10 years or so borrowed about $4,000 from someone in the People's Republic of China, and we are rich and they are poor. Right, Yeah. right, and if you see all the things that money could be used for in China, I'll give you just one example that yeah. sticks in my mind. This is from Gansu province out in northwestern China, an ethnic Tibetan community my wife and I saw. It's a school where, where the children walk each weekend to and from school because they live too far away to go back and forth every day and there's no cars or anything, they walk. During the school week, they live in dormitory rooms, teenage kids, 18 to a room that would house one person in a U.S. college, one, one person you know, here at Berkeley, and they're on bunk beds, nine people on the top bunk, nine on the bottom bunk, and their families on average have lent you and me and any other Warren Buffett and everybody else, they've lent us on average $4,000 per each of us when they're sleeping 18 to a room. And it's, there's a whole, again, history for it. The Chinese government wants to be, it's helped the Chinese government create new jobs and all that. But you can see the tension in this relationship over the long run. And, and you uh, quote Larry Summers as saying that what this, what we've all just, what we've just described has really created a balance of terror. China essentially <laughs> wants this uh, engine of jobs to keep going, right. uh, to, to build a middle class, uh, it wants to control inflation because of the vulnerability of the Communist Party. And on our side, our leaders basically have been 
creating a situation here where everybody is overspending, right. either through consumption, that we are in essence uh, uh, spending about $105 mm -hmm. and we're, we're making uh, uh, $95 worth. So that difference right. is, is, is coming from China. And we are very vulnerable to that. And in fact, as we're doing this interview in September of 2008, we have become even more vulnerable. Indeed, and it's worth maybe spelling out again why this deal would seem attractive from the Chinese government's point of view. Because if their main goal has been to keep things steadily rising, you know, being able to create manufacturing jobs is very important for that. And being able to control inflation is very important for that too. And so even if they've been keeping their people under spending, by holding the value, by controlling the value of the RMB, they've been able to keep these manufacturing plants growing and all that. So. It, it has made sense until now, and if, and if we knew it could go on forever, you could argue this is good for both sides. The Chinese get more and more jobs, we get more and more money, uh, which is you know, maybe not morally so admirable, but, it, but it's economically has been advantageous. And I think what Larry Summers was talking about is not so much that the Chinese would deliberately destabilize mm -hmm. the U.S. because that would hurt them too, but that it's an inherently volatile situation. So when you have market panics, as you and I speak, we're in the middle of one, it means that rather than damping down this disturbance, these imbalances tend to increase the disturbance and make things more likely to go out of, of control. The Chinese think, gee, we better get out before the house collapses from the U.S. market. So it's the, it's the fundamental instability of the situation which is, which is the danger. Uh, I want to move to a memo that you wrote to an imaginary <laughs> independent candidate who's running for president in 2016. You wrote this in 205. I read it in preparation for this interview, and it's somewhat <laughs> shocking how many, I mean, you have to tweak it here or there, but, but it's really shocking how many things you called. And, and then we'll get back to comparing the Chinese right. and the American people. But, but what you're advising this imaginary independent presidential candidate as he prepares for the election in 2016 is that how it all imploded and that uh, an independent candidate is a real possibility. And you, you identify the things that we did which relate to what mm -hmm. we've just talked about. Tell us about them, the Bush tax cut, the, the, the increase in, in Medicare prescription and right. so on, yeah. The, the background of this article, to say a word more about it, this was in, in the springtime of 2005, Cullen Murphy, who was then the editor of The Atlantic, was, I was talking with him, he said, we have to do something about this fiscal situation where the debt is going up so much, mm -hmm. where housing prices and mortgage debt is going up so much, this can't last forever. And the problem of writing about those things just straight out is it tends to become boring. So mm -hmm. I thought it would, I, I would propose this as a memo from the Karl Rove of the imagined future of the 2016 <laughs> election, talking about how the U.S. came into a Great Depression-type panic that finally led to the mm -hmm. breakup of the Republican Democratic Party system. And it had some touches which probably you know, are fanciful now, like the 2012 election being turned on when the person who wins that election is the war hero who captures Osama bin Laden in his cave mm -hmm. in 2012, uh, leading a parachute drop for, for this. <laughs> Uh, but, but it was said that, that to understand how we came to this collapse, you have to say, you know, with the big tax cuts which accompanied huge spending early in President Bush's first term, suddenly the U.S. was on a different course. Then not taking the opportunity to deal with the energy situation, so being whipsawed by gasoline prices. Then having all this house of cards involving housing debt. Mm -hmm. giving people this imaginary money in the form of home equity loans saying, okay, your home was worth $500,000 last year. Now it's worth a million and a half. Here's a loan for a million dollars. And you know it'll be at, at low, low rates for a while. And so why this was unstable, when there started to be a ripple in one thing, and I believe I had the first domino being uh, Chavez uh, in, in Venezuela mm -hmm, deciding right. to, uh, to cut off oil supply, sell, sell oil only to China. And mm -hmm. then uh, the U.S., uh, then, then it went on, on from there. So I, again, the emphasis is in finance, in life, in family relations, whatever, situations that are basically stable are more desirable, where if there's a kind of, you know, it's like having the marble in the bottom of the bowl. If you fill it up, it rolls back down to the bottom, that's fine. The opposite is the marble on the top of the bowl, mm -hmm. where if the bowl is upside down, and mm -hmm. any nudge in any direction, it goes shooting off. And so that was the image I was trying to say, that, that we've built a basically unstable situation, and 
sooner or later comes the reckoning of for the U.S. of basically living within our productive means. Mm -hmm. And and it was uh, you 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 give some numbers on the Bush tax cut, mm -hmm. which which reduced the the federal budget in a way that no president had yes. ever had to live with. There, there was the the prescription, uh, the Medicare <clears throat> prescription drug. Uh, which is, which uh, I believe you quote the Comptroller General as saying, you know, it was a, a fiscal nightmare, basically, that it would lead yeah. us to bankruptcy. But but I, there's a line in here in this article, uh, uh, which I thought relates again to China. Uh, the, uh, uh, had we been keeping our house in order, uh, 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 that we, in essence, were exporting jobs to China, mm -hmm. basically, in this nexus that we've just described, so that by by uh, turning to China, making it a manufacturing mm -hmm. base, they were uh, uh, creating jobs there mm -hmm. that might have been here under the right leadership. But then, on the other hand, they were giving the money to fund the excesses and irresponsible uh, fiscal policies of our leaders. Right, and for their own reasons, not like selling somebody enough rope to hang themselves, yeah, but, but yeah. just, just for, for their own reasons. And I guess one way I would, would refine that, I wrote that article shortly before I left for China, one way I'd refine it, having been in for a while, is that most of the jobs that have been sent to China, quote unquote, would not exist in the U.S. in their exact form. Now, in the United States, you'd never pay somebody to snap a pen together the way it's happening in China. What's happened, I think, is the, the, the real effect on jobs, I now think, is accelerating the rich-poor divide in the United States. That the same process which has sent factories around the world has made it harder for the classic high-end blue-collar job to exist. You know, the, the perhaps non-college mm -hmm. graduate good car job or steel factory job or whatever. And what it's done is there is relatively more money now for people who are the seat sorry, the CEOs of tech firms or architects or design firms or, you know, people from, in, let's say, the top quarter, the top 20 percent of the U.S. income distribution, on the whole, they are better off because of this interaction with China. Probably the bottom 30 percent of the income distribution is also better off because on limited incomes, they can buy more stuff at Walmart mm. or wherever because mm. of these Chinese prices. It's some fraction in the middle who had been, you know, not poor people, but, but high-end working class, those are the people that have been affected by, uh, by the shift to China. So economically, it is st a st statistical benefit for the U.S., but sociologically, it's part, it's one more thing, pushing the acceleration and polarization of the U.S. into richer and poorer groups. Mm -hmm. And the, the essentially the decline of the middle class. Yes. Now, in, in your background, again, I went back and read the first interview, you, you in comparing Japan and China, the, you, you saw, you said, well, we can never, that is, the United States can yeah. never be like Japan because we are a country of possibilities mm -hmm. where, as opposed to being told, told where to go and what to do and so on. And, and you, you said we had to be ourselves yes. to, in, in brief summary. So what I'm curious about is, uh, what is your judgment now about where we are yeah. as American, and how do you compare that with the Chinese spirit, which you're right. really getting a sense of? Um, and, and to triangulate this again, I think that, that this is almost a cliche, but China is way more like America than either of them is like Japan. Mm -hmm. you know, China, although it's, it has uh, you know, mass Mao-style mobilization within its recent history, and although you can find the demonstrations like the Olympic opening ceremony that look like you know, limitless seas of people all doing the same thing. It's basically, in my experience, a sort of individualistic, mm -hmm. opposed to rules society, like mm -hmm. the U.S. is, a country of entrepreneurs, a country of people who want to do something new, in contrast to Japan, in, in simple terms. And so I think that, that it, is, um, it is easier for the U.S. and China to sort of resonate culturally and, and individually than it is for either of them with, with Japan. This is entirely apart from the relentless anti-Japanese propaganda war that happens in China mm. every single day. Uh, so for the U.S., I think that, you know, as you and I speak, the U.S. is in the middle of an uh, intense presidential election between uh, Barack Obama and John McCain. Um, I hope that whoever is the next president can recognize that America's strength, not just in its international appeal, but also for its own resilience, 
involves a lot of these cultural and even ethical traits that have been part of America's role in the world. Um, I don't often find lines of Bill Clinton's to quote, but actually one in his 2008 Democratic Convention speech was in this, this mode when he said that foreign countries are more often impressed by the power of our example than mm -hmm. the example of our power. Mm -hmm. So if the mm -hmm. components of U.S. both esteem and vitality in the long run have been things like openness, you know, internally and also externally, um, equality, you know, some floor on, on how people will, will be, um, innovation, tolerance, rapid mobility, rule of law, procedural fairness, all these things. That, those are all, in my view, an important component of American national security, both in, mm -hmm. in, in, in making itself vital economically and influential internationally. So I hope that would be part of our next national security strategy. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm curious, you were a speechwriter for President Carter. I don't yeah. know if you contributed to the Malay speech. But I it, was off the payroll by then. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but, but it, it's an interesting uh, problem of how a, a president sort of talks to the American people before they're ready yes. uh, to, to understand the complexity of the problems. And uh, so I'm preparing for this interview, reading your articles, and then I'm watching the financial crisis, and it is quite extraordinary that our international entanglements, uh, our entanglements with China are not brought up at all. And, and I guess it is a, we're, we're solipsistic, we're caught in this bubble of our own preeminence, and, and, and it's quite extraordinary. So it, it strikes me that if you were a speechwriter for the president, you really have to begin addressing, but then what's going to yeah. happen if, if you're ahead of the curve and, and you, you know, is it the, the crash, the, the near crash mm -hmm. being so close to the abyss that will wake people up, do you think, or what? Yeah, th these, are, these are tangled issues, both of how we discuss political issues when we're making decisions, like in a presidential election, and then how presidents lead a after that. And I would say that, that an optimistic example, although it leads to a somewhat discouraging uh, you know, sequel, would be the mood of the country in the, say, three months after the 9-11 attacks, where you did have the sense the country was, a, the U.S. Was, was willing to consider anything and do anything and get serious. Unfortunately, in my view, it was told all the wrong things about what to do. You know, that was a time we could have had a whole different energy plan, we could have had a whole different uh, approach to engaging the world. We could have used, we could have had a different f a financial plan, but, but we didn't. So I think the bad side of that, that story is what happened. The good side is what could have happened. And I'm not saying we need another uh, complete 1929 style uh, economic collapse to get people's attention, but I think that, that, that the balance for the United States, you know, I think there was, what is Winston Churchill's line or somebody, the United States will always do the right thing when it's exhausted every other possibility. The question is, do we have the leeway to exhaust every other possibility? Mm -hmm. the, the positive view would be to say that, that when situ the situation gets serious enough, so will the U.S. about energy, about finances, about whatever, about international legitimacy, and so a new president can do that. The less positive side would be saying we've used up our margin, you know, that we've gone too far. I am optimistic by nature. I think that the U.S. will respond to those things. But if this current election turn, in the end turns on things like completely distorted campaign advertisements and lipstick on a pig and things like that, mm -hmm. that will be a strong evidence that we've lost the capacity to self-govern, in my view. Mm -hmm. and, and what, what responsibility does the media have for this. You, you've written quite a bit on on uh, what has gone wrong with yeah. the media and so on. Uh, it would seem that there's a kind of general dumbing down, you know, he said, she yeah. said, and, and so on. And, and any thoughts about? Yeah, the, the strongest counter argument to my basic optimism would be what's happened to the media and around the media in the last 15 years. I did publish a book now 12 years ago called Breaking the News. That was before cable TV existed, cable TV <laughs> news. And you know, Fox News Channel didn't mm -hmm. <laughs> exist then. And I was arguing that the spectacle value of news was drowning out the other things it did. So, and that what it had to do to survive as a business 
was increasingly at odds with what it should do to kind of make the nation cohere. And I think the, the shorthand version of what you've seen since then is that the media now present different people with different versions of reality, and these realities don't intersect. I mean, if 30 or 40% 40, 40 of the people in the U.S. believe that Barack Obama is a Muslim, and that shows there's something that's failed in our ability to, to not to disagree about political goals, but to establish basic facts. And I don't know what it is in the media structure that can change that, because the natural tendency of, of specialization of news organizations, of the internet, of more and more cable channels, is to have news pre-targeted to particular groups. So the MSNBC crowd has one view of reality, the Fox News crowd has another view of reality, and there's no point of intersection between those realities. So while the media are part of this problem, I don't really know what the media can do to solve it now, because there's essentially, most of the time, absent real national crisis, there's no legitimate, authoritative, believed across political mm -hmm. boundaries media source who can say, this is white, and this is black, and this is red, and this is green, mm -hmm. because it all gets parsed different ways. So this is the area where, where as a journalist myself, all I can do day by day is try my best to explain to people who will listen to me what I think is what's my best understanding of what's going on. But in a larger, larger scene, it is uh, troubling. You, you've written recently about the debating skills of, of the two candidates and so on, and, and I think, uh, I guess the, the, the issue, you, you've pointed out Obama's vulnerabilities, you, uh, you have pointed out uh, some, of, you know, some of the things that uh, uh, McCain can do, whether he can do it in a, in a debate context, we don't, don't know. What, what, what do you think, how can the presidential election and the debates become an occasion to sort of lay out the kinds of things that you're writing yeah. about about China? Because we have to understand that, mm -hmm. you know, whether we're a Republican or a Democrat, if we're going to uh, move together to resolve these right. problems. I think if you wanted to feel relatively good about the American political process, which often can drive you crazy and feel just mm -hmm. uh, despairing, you could look at the general election cycle presidential debates, you know, the heavyweight contender mm -hmm. ones, ones the, the two finalists. Because I think you know, the primary season debate is often a carnival of, uh, of triviality and, and gotchas, as yes. I was writing about in this, uh, this yeah. Atlantic article. But most of the time, the audience for the general election debates, the audience is enormous. You, know, you have 70, 80 million people watching this thing, which is a huge number of people who are watching. And the reasons they are watching, the main reason they're watching is the same reason people watch the Super Bowl, which is that it's a live contest among the people at, at the top, and that many, many times what's happened under these live circumstances has made a difference in the election. There are some pollsters who say it doesn't really make a difference, and you can do the statistical analysis, but in an emotional way, I think it makes people, it usually confirms something they suspected. You know, mm -hmm. that, that this person sounded too old, or that person sounded too mean, or this person really did connect. And, and the moments that resonate from debates often can't be predicted, you know, so they're surprising. And along the way, the candidates usually say something about mm -hmm. China, about Russia, about Social Security. And so I think it's the, it's the closest thing we have to an actual moment of civic engagement, of seeing a very wide audience of people watching a live contest between two people trying very hard. So I think they're actually valuable. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, just as, as we conclude, I'm, I'm curious, how do you think the Chinese will uh, respond to the financial uh, situation? Because I, they've got a lot of cards, but some of the cards are weak because, they, we've, as we've discussed, they're yeah. intertwined with us. By chance, I've had an uh, opportunity in the month or so s before our talk now to talk with very senior Chinese officials about this very question. And in the short term, they are committed to the U.S. market just by circumstance. If they, they're such large players that if they join the rush out of U.S. securities, they intensify the panic, they hurt themselves. But I think they are very seriously looking at American politics now in a judging its seriousness. You know, can the U.S. really deal with these financial issues in a mature way? Mm. As it chooses its next leader, 
what kind of issues is it, is it weighing or not. And I uh, think that, that if they feel the U.S. is incapable of making mature, responsible, doing the hard thing decisions about its markets right now and its debts and paying its own way, I think over time they will begin moving assets out of the U.S. because they'll feel it's not a safe haven in the long run. In the short term, they're in as everybody is in because otherwise it would be a disaster. Mm -hmm. But in the long run, I think they are watch they're sort of testing us at the moment. And, and one final question, where would, where would you like to see the, you know, China go in its relation with the U.S.? I mean, what, what, and I guess I'm also asking you sort of what are the possibilities for getting out of these, the negative elements right. of the entanglement and moving toward a, a positive uh, outcome? If I were stressing a couple of things in the U.S. to people who knew nothing about China, the couple of things I'd stress are, number one, it's not just China. It's, it's a billion plus people with all these conflicting goals, and they're individuals, and so you shouldn't think, we shouldn't think of it as a one big entity. Number two, however, we should think of it as something that we don't have a choice about engaging or not. It's like saying, well, are you going to, how do you feel about the sun coming up tomorrow? You know, it's China is going to be a major, is already a major part in our activities, and that reality has to be part of everything we do. But number three, it doesn't have to be a problem for us. You know, China doesn't go into this, in my view, thinking we're going to squash the United States, we're going to humiliate the United States. They really don't care about the U.S. that much. They care about their own development. And it's possible for this to be basically a partnership as opposed to basically a, a, a confrontation. So I think if the U.S. recognizes this is part of its future and it doesn't have to be bad, so we should think about a, a positive engagement, that would be a big help. Well, Jim, uh, thank you very much for coming here to be the Elberg Lecturer, being on our program, uh, and uh, we look forward to your collection of essays, which is coming out, I think, in January, and then thereafter uh, a book on China. And in the meantime, everybody can subscribe to The Atlantic. Yes, indeed. And go to <laughs> Atlantic.com uh, uh, to read your blog. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Harry. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.